it's another week so hello and welcome i'm sure with mccaskey thanks for your time you are watching program number seven in the carrot series of today is a funny night now after days of rioting in barbados or as one noted historians would say after days of the start of that ongoing revolution in barbados the question on everyone's mind was why? Why? Why did this happen in Barbados? Well, in answering that question, historian Dr. David Brown references the widely discussed moral economy. It's an ideology he borrowed from the French Revolution. Moral economy states that when there's an uprising, the People take from who they think took from them before. So therefore, they're not doing anything wrong. So during the French Revolution, the, the French say they are hungry. When they tell Mary Antoinette that the people are hungry and they want bread, she said if they ain't got bread, they'll eat cake. A kind of arrogance. The, the, the working class is always arrogant to their own detriment. So. I look at that methodology and apply it to Barbados. The whole concept of a moral economy. Now, Dr. Brown did succeed in proving his theory. In fact, noted historians applauded him for doing so. Now, as it related to Barbados, exactly what did he intend on proving? I wanted to show that when people went into the country district, they weren't just rioting and licking up the place they call they can do it. They had reason. There were people who were raiding potato fields, and they were making a statement by their actions. Um, I think, I don't recall the particular plantation, where over a, a period of night, workers raided over four acres of yams. And there was no evidence of them selling them. They couldn't be eating so much yams. They were making a statement. They were getting back. Uh, who oppressed them over a long period of time. And the destruction of the property of whites was clearly demonstrated by that. That is what I, I wanted to demonstrate there. The whole idea of, of moral economy, it was done in the English rights of the 17th century, the French, and I took a methodology and applied it to the Barbados situation. I show in time, um, Walter Rodney did it in the history of the uh, Guyanese working people. He did it in Guyana. Uh, I show uh, over a period of time, a reassessment of what occurred in the 1930s. I would like to see other historians who are first in this area look at applying the methodology for the other islands. This is what this series is all about, revisiting that history, reassessing that history, and deconstructing that history which occurred in Barbados in July 1937. That which led to the riots here in the city of Bridgetown and throughout rural Barbados. Or as one historians would say, that which led to the start of a revolution that continues today. So therefore, once again, I want to say that it is a myth that there were riots, that these were just stupid backward, illiterate black people licking up Bridgetown. The consciousness, political consciousness, was there from the 1920s, and they showed by the actions. Another thing I want to make sure is that in the methodology as well, if people have left no written records, how do you analyze their contribution? So I look at their actions and made some logical deductions about what they were thinking. Because except for a few times when they openly said what they were doing, the, we were, I paid attention to their actions to tell me what they were thinking. Dr. Brown holds firmly the view that those who participated in the riots had a strong political consciousness and we're acting based on a deeper moral issue. The authorities would declare martial law. The troops would come in. Some people were killed. 
people burn and loot. And because of how it happened, some people refer to it as a riot. We believe that there was method in their madness in what they were doing. They were making, the workers were making a political statement by their actions. So it wasn't just a spontaneous uprising that people decided to just loot and burn and mash up. They were angry. They had no outlets for their grievances. The colonial authorities weren't listening. The local um, authorities, the local white elite throughout the region didn't care as far as they're concerned. And so the workers uprising, in my opinion, was justified. They were making political statements. It is the changing of the order by those from below. Deconstructing history and examining all of the indicators before reaching a conclusion. Meanwhile, the authorities are aware that people engaging in the riot are not necessarily raiding to satisfy any personal hunger at that time, but more so to make a strong political statement to the ruling class. The colonial authorities asked for the HMS Apollo to the British troops to come and help put down the rebellion. And they are challenging the police, throwing stones at, at, at the police, and of course, with the superior power of the state, it, it was put, put down. But on the 27th of July, 1937, a delegation of Grand President Grant, the Adams, Hilton Vaughan, and some others went before the colonial governor. And they made basically two points. They mentioned that this is no ordinary rebellion, that the Barbadian workers are making a very serious statement. And I think it was G.E.T. Branker and Grant Lee Adams who said, let us set up an economic commission. That's what they're calling. In other words, let us investigate what, is, what is, has happened here. Now, that request by then attorney at law Grant Lee Adams, now national hero to right excellence Sir Grant Lee Adams, and some of his colleagues did not fall on deaf ears. In the end, the governor, Governor Samar Young, appointed a special commission to investigate the activities of the police and the volunteer force. What one might notice is that all of the reports, all of the reports that were eventually commissioned to investigate the disturbances or the rebellion, all of them painted more or less the same picture about deplorable living and working conditions for the mass of the people, wherever you go. So we have three commissions being set up to investigate the revolt of 1937. There's the Dean Commission, led by Sir George Dean. Dean represents the local, meaning now the Barbadian version of an investigation into what caused what they call the disturbances. That is what, what the Dean is about. And that Dean Commission in September, look into details as to the local situation. And that in itself is another discussion. Uh, the people who went before the commission, what they said, they look at all aspects of Barbadian life. And Barbados was a place that was really a boiling cauldron. It was, it was about to explode um, because of the deep-seated poverty, lack of education, poor sanitation, some of the most despicable housing conditions, both in the rural and the urban areas, with the widespread malnutrition, everything. That's what that Dean Commission revealed in 1937. The Dean com was made up of, was really three people. This man called Dean, Sir George Dean, who was the chair, and it is called the Dean Commission, but I don't think that 
when you look at it carefully, that it really is Dean's report, but I know he was chair of the thing. The other two people was a man called Murphy, who I think uh, had connections out to Trinidad. He was a civil servant in Trinidad. Why he was chosen, I'm not too clear. But the third person, and that he's a critical person, is this man who eventually we know as Sir Erskine Ward. Sir Erskine Ward was the local, and, and I really emphasize now, the local component of that commission. And we could go further. I mean, people, people of the time, say somebody that went to Crawford. Winter Crawford will say that the, the general understanding was that it's Erskine Ward who wrote the report. If you continually read the works of others regularly, you begin to engage in content analysis. You begin to get a sense of how an individual would string words together to form sentences. Now, having read the report and the writings of one of our more popular writers at that time, it seemed quite evident to many who was responsible for the report. I mean, and I think that when you, when you look at the report and you compare the report to, to some of Erskine's editorials and the advocate, because he, 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 for a time he was a journalist, you can in fact hear the same voice. And more than that, Erskine had been a politician at one stage and part of what was called the progressive movement. So that really, therefore, he was in tune with Barbados and what was happening in Barbados in a way that none of the others could match. So what I'm saying, and I have looked at it fairly carefully because we have written a little piece on Erskine for, for a project we have, a dictionary of Barbadian biography. When you, look, when you look at it carefully, I think that therefore all the rumors that surrounding the writing of the report and the content of the report, I think are accurate. That that was war, that was war's report, okay? Because I mean, I mean, a lot of local knowledge was obviously brought to bear on the investigation and also on the recommendation. And the only person in that committee or commission who had that detailed local knowledge was Erskine Ward. There was also another commission which took on a regional approach, wider perspective, accounting not merely for Barbados, but for the West Indies. There's the Royal Commission or the Mine Commission. This is a British commission chaired by Lord Moyne. And the mine, on the other hand, the mine, of course, is the British government's reaction to this wave of insurrection which went through the British Caribbean from 1935 up to 1939. There are some cabinet minutes by a P.F. Campbell. He was supposed to be an expert on West Indian matters. And he made it clear that something is wrong. That's the words he used in the West Indies and that there's a West Indian problem. We, we, we are a problem for the British. And he came to that conclusion after you had the the social rebellion in Jamaica. But the signs were there from St. Kitts and Vincent in the 1930s, Trinidad and Tobago, and then when there was the uprising in Jamaica, the, the British government then st started to take the Caribbean serious, and they had the, the Mine Commission. So they were moved, for a variety of reasons, to take an overall look at that situation. So they sent down that commission to our part of the region to investigate and to make recommendations. So mine is regional, in our sense of regional, but Dean of just, is just Barbados. That was done in 1938, 19, 1939, not released until 1945. But if you look into the Mine Commission report, I mean, you, you, you have the full picture for our region. Okay? The report is often cited it did not present a good picture. Historian Dr. Brown did read that report. You will see how the British refused to publish the report because of the possibility of an international backlash. The British themselves were shame at what they discovered. Some saw that this is 1938. The commission visited the West Indies the better part of 1939, collecting evidence going from island to island and territory to territory, collecting its evidence. Then they discovered what 
had happened in the Caribbean. They were now in a conflict with Hitler and Mussolini in Europe. They were so ashamed at what they discovered that they held back the evidence to the end of the war. But they published the report. They were afraid that the Nazis would use it for propaganda. They could have used it. They presided over an empire in which they say the sun never set. But some of the most disgusting forms of poverty any part of the world existed on the British rule. They owe us reparations for what they have done to us, even up into this period. And they can prove beyond a shadow of doubt. Well, it's all yours, Dr. Brown. Talk your talk and prove your point. Now, to prove his point, Dr. Brown brings us forward a little and he calls attention to something that occurred in the 1960s. The British had an opportunity with the little eight. An economic commission looked into the state of the islands and they were pushing a little eight federation. And that commission said it would take over 200 million Canadian dollars to jumpstart the economies of the Eastern Caribbean if you want federation. The documents are all there now. The British backed out. They, they had another opportunity to eliminate poverty that they caused through their colonial, uh, through their colonial experience, and they backed out. Now, having shown the continuity with the link and what occurred after the 1930s, Dr. Brown takes us back to the setting of the discussion the reports of the situation of the 1930s. And you will know that a sum of money was decided on by the British. This money was to be used for infrastructural development in the islands. Back in the 1930s, the Moyne Commission went throughout the Caribbean, as they say. They discussed some very, they discovered some very miserable forms of poverty and such like but they made recommendations. They held back the evidence. They made recommendations. And here the British are admitting that they are going to give us a million pounds for 20 years. So if you add 20 to 1939, it should end around 1954. And that, that investment to the welfare, colonial development and welfare fund and act, funded some development projects throughout the West Indies. I, I could think of the East Coast Road here in Barbados, Point Primary School, and there's uh, that money that came out of the colonial. I think Common Mayor, the new Common Mayor in Waterford was funded by some of that funds. So here were the British then recognizing that they must do something to eliminate the poverty because I can tell you without a shadow of doubt, they were very afraid of what happened in the Caribbean. Uh, P.F. Campbell described people in the Caribbean as fickle and that they're easily excited, that's, what, that's how he put it. In other words, if you don't do something about these people, you're going to have some trouble again in your empire. Not that they wanted to see any development I don't think so, that they were genuine about it. They were afraid of another rising in their empire. Now, their, their empire stretched all over the world. There is yet another commission. This one was established to investigate the actions of the police and other volunteers. It's called the Local Forces Commission, chaired by Williams. Now, this commission had over 100 witnesses because people came in and gave evidence to this commission about why people were shot and how people were shot. In 1939, colonial governor made reference to an inquiry, a commission that was set up to look into the people who were killed and injured. He made reference to it. I searched the Barbados archives, can't find it. When I went to England, I went and looked for it, can't find it. I even sent my cousin in England, nobody can find it in England either, in the, in the report. I know it exists. 
What I find interesting is Hilton Vaughan was part of the commission. The Hilton Vaughan papers are there in the archives. I've made a request to the late Dr. Phillips that if I can get permission to, among, to go among the Vaughan papers, I was told that they are not sorted out, and, by the, and therefore I cannot see them. I find it strange that some person be part of a commission and was never given a copy. So if there should be one place this report should exist, would be among the Vaughan papers, because he was part of this committee that looking to the number of people who write it who got killed and their compensation. But it became a secret that I can't understand from then to the present time. We certainly hope that this is not the situation. Finding that report would close a gap that existed in our history and in the lives of many of our people. It would certainly bring closure to Mr. Aline and his family on whose story this entire series is built and which will be revealed later in the series. And my search again for this committee's report was only recently. Nobody can find it. The people in the archives say it doesn't exist. Um, and in England, I went to search as well in England for it when I was in England and we didn't find it either. I, I would suggest that among the papers of Mark Young, so Mark Young, that it may be among the, he made reference to it um, in correspondence to his, uh, talk to his superiors in England. But that will go a long way in clarifying it. So we have to live for the time being with the thought that we don't have the true picture of what really happened. We know people were killed and injured and in prison. But the November, those who are in prison, um, it's very easy to put it together because the November 1937 grand sessions were published in the Advocate. So you will see who got um, hard labor for throwing stones, for breaking into a store, for stealing, and that sort of thing. Right. So that is as much as I can tell you on that particular one. And until we find that report that was issued by that committee, we're going to stay in the dark for a very long time. Rest assured, there are a number of us who are willing to accept that challenge and search for that report. So it is going to say a lot. I, I got the impression that the committee was supposed to be no hose barred, tell us the truth about this whole thing. So it revealed a lot. It revealed, it should reveal a lot about what some person or persons, and I'm sure the colonial authorities were among them, don't want the general public to know. The, the governor at that time made reference to it. What I found strange is I think that it was supposed to be laid as a document before Parliament, so it is not among the parliamentary papers. It is mentioned in the official gazette at the time, but if, if you've laid, I, I've garnished a lot of information from reports. The whole parliamentary procedure is any report must be laid before Parliament. So if you look among the official goes that you will find it there, and among the minutes of Parliament. But that is mentioned as a document laid before Parliament, but it doesn't exist among the official gazette and the documents in Parliament. It's, it's not there. And we are convinced that somebody don't want us to see it. So that's as much as I can tell you about it. I will continue searching. Now, if you have already done so, or if you are lucky enough to come across the findings of this commission, please do get in touch with us. We want to hear from you. That brings us now to another question. What about the speeches of the right excellent Clement Osborne Payne? I'm convinced that the speeches of Clement Payne exist somewhere in this island or in Britain two have been revealed. Every night, the police were there standing up, writing down everything, Clement Payne said, how come you got the speeches of others and you don't have them appear? Now, 
we have come across some of what uh, Penn lieutenants say when in 1939, Arthur Greek Jones got up in Parliament, Lord Passfield, and he said, are you aware that in a party and party of pressing trade in a movement? And he mentioned you were at Butler in Trinidad. And one of paying lieutenants here in Barbados. And the, the British said, look, we want to know what this is all about. And the colonial governor sent up a massive document. Albert Grant. Albert Grant with what Grant and others had to say. So we had an idea. And the, the speeches were based on the political meeting they held the night when Payne was arrested. They held a political meeting. And the speeches were there. And they revealed a lot about what they think about the colonial authorities and wages and all. And you get a good idea of the issues then. So uh, that is as much as I can tell you. There are certain things that some of them convinced that should not, or somebody think, should not be seen by the public. And they're the two, one, two that I am very concerned about. I know that those species existed somewhere in Barbados, among somebody papers, or in England, but you'll never be able to get those papers. Let's keep hope alive that those speeches will come to light someday. Now, as I bring this program to a close right here in Independence Square, I couldn't help but notice the number of individuals who are here in a sense recreating themselves and enjoying the ambience. I wonder perhaps if they are the descendants of any of those revolutionaries who were bold enough to come out in 1937 and make a statement with their actions. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for your time. This has been today is a funny night.